Thank you for being with us today. We would love to have you join us in person. To partner with us or to give online, go to www.upperroomohio.com. We hope you enjoy this message. Thank you. The good news, when you drink coffee and you speak up here, no one can, I'm like, nah, nah, nah. don't get close to me. I have a mint for later, but I won't put it in now. Well, happy Mother's Day. Yay. You know what? I just, I felt like just, man, as we were talking about mothers and stuff, my heart was just really going out to those of you who aren't moms for whatever reason, you're too young, too old, you just never had any kids, just whatever. I just, my heart just went out and I just wanted to affirm like, you are a mother. There is someone or many who you are mothering and you don't know. I just felt like that was really a word from the Lord. So um, if you struggle with that or you have some of those thoughts, like you are a mom, you are mothering well. And so just wanted to affirm that in you, but okay, well, Today is a day for mothers, but it's tricky when you're up here on, it, the temptation would be to just speak only to the moms. So the, the, the tricky part is to figure out what can I talk about that moms really deal with or struggle with or women in general, but also now we gotta make sure we tap into the men because if not, they're gonna be bored the whole time and you can't just do like a women's message, right? So, um, what I really felt like God was really pressing on me throughout the past few weeks was just um, just this whole comparison trap. And that's something that really resonates, I know, with, with women. But I was thinking about, like, what I know about my husband. And, like, men do this too, okay? And yours might just look, men's just probably looks a little different. Like, they walk into the room and they just, like, get puffed out or, you know, they're, they're comparing their, like, they're comparing their arms and they want their arms bigger. And when women compare their arms, they don't want their arms bigger. And, you know, it's just like, it's all different, but you know, you're doing it. Right. And so this is something that we all deal with. And even if you're a business owner, you know, you're, you're comparing, like, is my business successful compared to that business? You know, so it's just, this is something that can hit everyone, no matter what context we put it in. And so, um, I just, uh, that's just kind of what I'm going to go with today. So I hope it ministers to you. It ministers to me. And so I'm not selfish, but if it ministers just to me, then that's fine with me. So, um, but okay. So a couple weeks ago I was on Facebook and I'm sorry, I'm not going to be sorry about it. I do enjoy scrolling Facebook. And so I was on there and I, this one day, there's always this one person that you guys don't know, someone from my past someone that doesn't live even close to us, but it's always popping up on my Facebook feed. And I find myself every single day, I promise you, it's every single day, it's almost like the devil is like, yes, doing this intentionally, but every single day, the same post uh, video, you know how people like love to do video blurps or whatever? So the same video comes up, and every day, it's a new one, obviously, and every day, I, I somehow see it, and I somehow get caught up in it, and I somehow start to pick apart myself and this person and just do this whole entire comparison thing. Finally, one day, I felt like the Lord was just like, well, bam, like conviction. Like, what are you doing? Because then it would just kind of like determine, I don't know, it was almost like as I was comparing myself to this person, like it made me feel better that I felt like I was better than. That, to hear myself say that, it's terrible. But um, that's, just, that's just what I was wrapped up in. And, and God just really revealed it to me. And because and I was kind of like, no, I'm just, in, I'm just like intrigued. I just want to, but then no, it was like, God was like, no, that is not why you're watching that. You are not just intrigued, you're in this com competition. And, um, and so then I just realized like, that is not freedom. That is not freedom. And I, I don't want to be bogged down. I don't want to be tied down. I don't want to be bound up in any of that kind of stuff and any of those types of thoughts. And, and so it just began this kind of like journey. I was like, 
Um, and you can put up the screen, the, the slide, the freedom slide that talks about where freedom begins. Because this is the revelation that the Lord spoke to me in that moment. is like, your freedom begins where judgment and comparison end. And it's like, you know what? That's so true. Like, I am not walking in freedom when I compare myself to someone else and I feel like, all right, cool. I am better than that. I look better than that. That's not freedom. And it's definitely not freedom when you're walking around just beating yourself up because you're not as good as someone or something else, right? So it goes both ways. That's the two types. It's when we get excited or we are thrilled that we're better than, or then there's the other type when we're down because we're not as good as, right? So there's these two things that, that go on. Um, okay, so so the, put up, can you put up the slide that says... Um, the, the one that talks about Jesus has no desire. Okay, Jesus has no desire. I love this. Jesus has no desire to climb the ladder of the Trinity. He seeks the Father's glory. This is just a prime just thought that's like, you don't see Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit like competing with each other. Who's doing this? Who's doing that? Who's it? You know, like, oh, Jesus healed this guy. The Holy Spirit did that. You know, no. They're working together. There's no intent in Jesus' heart, mind, thought, whatever, to climb that ladder, right? And, and so we are to be imitators of Christ, and so that's our, that's our motive. We're not trying to climb the ladder. We're not trying to outdo this person or that person. We're not trying to... I think it's just a matter of examining our motives. Okay, so for me, um, go, I'm kind of on this, like, health journey, it was a forced health journey that I was mad about, but now I'm kind of like happy about it. But I found out I had some uh, autoimmune things going on with my thyroid, right? And so like the first rule, no gluten. And I am mad about it. I'm not gonna lie. I'm just mad because I like to eat. And I like to eat what I want. I don't have to worry about what's in my food other than the fact that like, I've always been very in tune with like preservatives and that type of thing. But I'm saying I don't want to not eat a brownie. Brownies are my favorite. And now I can't really eat brownies. I know there's gluten-free ones, but it's not the same. And um, so I, I'm just on this health journey. And, and as I'm doing it, my, I, I'm learning so much. But now I've kind of crossed over from being mad but to now I'm like sort of glad I'm like in the middle of that. But I'm, 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 my motives for my health are not because I want to look better than anybody else or I want to be the skinniest person in the room or I want to be able to lift more weights than this person. My motives are good for what I'm doing. But unfortunately, a lot of times our motives for why we do things is because we're trying to outdo this person or outdo this thing or be better than that or to rise above someone else. And so that's when it starts to get really sticky and really twisted. And so I, I love the thing that Jesus has no desire to climb the ladder because it just reminds me of how fluidly these, these, this, the Trinity works out. Like, oh, they just flow so evenly edifying each other. All right, so let's find a Bible story to go with this because I do believe in that. And so in 1 Samuel 18, 5 through 8, we're going to go into the story of Saul and David. I was really wanting to find a women's one, a women's comparison thing, but I just I went with Saul and David, which is so good. All right, 18, 5 through 8. I'm going to read it. Cool. Cool. Whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it so successfully that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the people and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all of the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with tambourines and lutes. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Now in verse 8 it says, Saul was very angry. This refrain gall galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And then in verse 9 it says, And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Now leading up to that point, Saul was, was noticing like David's doing great things, and he was actually helping promote him. I mean, what? His eye... Had not, been look on, look, had not been looking at David in any other way than to be like, wow, he's doing amazing. Let's like, 
let's like promote that because you know it was it was he was doing well and Saul was confident in himself. But the minute he felt that he was being compared to and he wasn't and, and in his eyes, you know, he only did thousands, but David did tens th- tens of thousands. Instantly what happens? Jealousy creeps in and now what happens in chapter 19? Now Saul's trying to kill him. So the, these are the types of things that happen as soon as, what, like, what does it look like if, if we walked around all the time and when we, we saw people or diff, different things or somebody else was excelling, that we just encouraged it and promoted it. And like, I love, I love that I have this opportunity so many days with this microphone because I want to encourage and promote different things. I love being able to get up here and talk about how amazing Steve is and how he's doing amazing things. He's reaching so many people that I'm not, but I'm not looking at it like, oh, I'm not doing as big of a thing. No, I'm promoting what he's doing because that's awesome. And because I know that what I'm doing is making an impact too. But the minute that we start to twist it, we start to compare it in a negative manner, and we start to turn it into jealousy, bad things start to happen, right? And so this is exactly what happened in the Saul, the Saul and David story. All right, so now, and so now he's got the plot to kill David. And as I was reading this, I was like, the Lord showed me his jealousy, Saul's jealousy, turned into such hatred that he wanted to kill David, and. I, I don't know if I heard this somewhere or what, but I tell the girls a lot, you know, when we use the word hate, it is so strong. Like, to me, when I say I hate something or someone, that means basically I want them dead, right? This is, the, this is what happened. Saul began to hate David so much that he wanted him dead. So that, look at, look at how that just leads. It's just like a slippery slope that leads from one thought, leads to another, leads to another, and you want somebody dead? You hate them that much? And so it's just such a trap. Mark Twain has a quote that I found in the Kroger ad, such a random spot, but I, I thought it was phenomenal, and it says, comparison is the thief of joy. Because now all of a sudden, what's happened to Saul? He was excited for David. He was like things were happening for him, but the next thing you know, he instantly starts to compare himself, and now his joy is robbed, and all he can focus on is wanting someone killed. And compare, so comparison is the thief of our joy. Oh, it's, it's just, I'm like, that's profound. Um, okay, now, as I was processing through this, I'm like, why is it, I think I, I said at first service, like, I feel like probably every one of us in here has this issue, struggles with it to some degree at some point, maybe not now, maybe you used to, but what is the root? What is the reason that we feel like we, we have to compare ourselves or we have to measure up or we have to be this good or, you know, what, what is that? And I just keep coming back to the whole identity piece. And I, I think that, like, I totally 100% believe in the, the, we've got to know who we are. We have to know our identity. I totally believe in it. But sometimes, isn't it just easier said than done? Like, it's just easier said than done sometimes. And so it made me think about Aaron's message last week and how he had so much goodness packed in there. And I feel like it could be broken up into weeks of messages. But, uh. I, I really pulled from the part that he didn't really get to elaborate on when he talked about our identity, and it's based on three, there's three pieces to that, and the first one was, how do we view God, how do, we, how do I view myself, and how do I view others, right? So I kind of want to take this and, and tie all those together. So if you look at the first one, how do I view God? Well, first of all, God is good. God is good. He only wants what's best for us. He only wants to give us good things. He only gives us good things. So if his desire for me is good things, then what am I doing getting caught up and looking at someone else's good things and wondering why the truths and remind ourselves of the truths and speak truths, then we're not going to get caught in this trap, this thing of this comparison issue, right? So I could start to believe that I, I'm, let's see. I don't know, I was going to say I'm getting wrinkles, but that is a truth, but not a lie. But um, let's see, I can start to believe something that's not true. I don't know. I can start to believe that I don't have what it takes. I don't have the confidence. Like, I was sitting over there telling him, I'm not feeling this. And then that, that's a lie. And what could happen is it could start to, like, compare myself to what 
last week's message may have looked like, but instantly I had to snap into the truth. The truth is, you have what you take, this me- or you have what it takes. This message is going to penetrate hearts, like stepping into what the truths are. And we have to be so aware of what are we believing? Where is our mindset going? What are we wallowing in, right? Um, and then also, our views of God is compliments versus comparison, right? He rejoices over us. The Bible talks about it. He rejoices over us with singing. He made us. He loves us. We're the apple of his eye. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. All of these things. These are the compliments he gives us. But for some reason, we, st- we tend to listen to the things that the people say, right? We're, we're hearing those words instead of his. Um, okay, Isaiah 2, 22. This is such a powerful command. It says, stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't know why. I don't know. But that tells me to stop. And, and, And so I believe in people. I love people. I value what people have to say. There, I don't, this is not talking about when people are pouring wisdom into you and, and influencing in your lives. This is talking about, I, I feel like it's talking about all the stuff that you're getting caught up in that people are saying and putting on you. Why? They're humans. It's like, hello, get back on the track. Get back on the focus. It's such a good verse. All right, so that's all of our view. That's my whole part about the view of God. Now, what about this? How do I view myself? Remember, these are the things that we do that help form our identity, build our identity, help us become confident in who we are. How do I view myself? Okay, let's go to Psalm 139. I'm just going to start at verse 13. Yeah, okay, thank you. For you created my inmost being. Okay, this is how I, this is, this is how we are to view ourselves, right? For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So if his works are wonderful, I am one of his works. So what am I? I'm wonderful, right? My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my, uni- my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. I want to stop right there. How, how precious to me are your thoughts. I want that to be... That is what I want. I want to encompass that. When I see the word precious, I think of like a little, like a newborn baby. And that's about the only time I can look at my kid and say, you are so precious. Just kidding. But you, you, you're very delicate with that, you know? And you look at them and you're just like, oh, it's so precious, right? And it's just like, you're so delicate. You're very gentle. It's like, I want that to be my heart's cry. How precious are his thoughts for me. I want to take his thoughts and I want to be really gentle with them and I want them to penetrate into my mind and my spirit. I want to take it serious. I don't want to just toss his thoughts to the side. Okay. There is a poem I have. Before I play the poem, or before you put the poem up, I wanted to say this too. Something else when we view ourselves, it's so important. I forgot to say this the last time. It's so important for us to know our strengths and our weaknesses. What? Okay, Leah and I were laughing in the office before this service, and we were talking about this um, friend that we both have. And she's amazing. Like, she literally is amazing. We love her. But if we start to compare ourselves to this, this woman, we will, we will just want to go in a hole. She is, uh, she's a mom of six kids now, and she'll put things on Facebook. I, Facebook's really driving me to death, so maybe I should just get off of it. But anyway pray about that. Um, She'll put things like, it's like 6 a.m. I promise, I promise this. This is the truth. It's 6 a.m. and a list of all the stuff that she's already done. I've done three loads of laundry, folded and put away. I packed everybody's lunches, and I have dinner in the crock pot. 
and she showered. Now, I don't know if she washed her hair, may have been second or third day hair, but she showered, she has makeup on, and her kids are like ready to go to school. This is, this is the truth, I promise you. And you know what I need to know? I need to know her strengths may not be my strengths. And I am not gonna be able to, I'm not gonna be able to get up at 4 a.m. and get all that accomplished and still be worth anything to myself or my family at 5 p.m. And, and so that's, that's the thing, we have to be aware. My strengths are not someone else's strengths necessarily, and what we try to do is we try to compare the two. Well, if she's doing that, I should be doing that. No, that's not, that might not be my strength. And I also need to know that my weaknesses. If my weakness is chocolate, it is. On my new health plan, I told the lady that's kind of coaching me through and helping with meal planning, I said, I need to eat chocolate every day. Don't take away my chocolate. Anyway, it's a weakness. And somebody else may be able to go two weeks and not have chocolate. And, and what happens? I start to compare myself and think, well, why can't I do that? You know what? I don't care. Chocolate is my weakness. And, you know, I'm not making it be my strength. So I'm just saying we, it's so important for us to know our strengths and our weaknesses because we can't. It's, there, we can never compare ourselves to someone else because we are not exactly the same person. It's not, like, it's not like two robots that were created to be exactly the same. And you look at one and you're like, oh, that one's a little dented right there and that one's not. That's a fair comparison. But to compare you and I, we just learned. God, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are knit together specific. To compare ourselves to someone else who's not meant to be like us is silly. It's insanity. All right, now the poem. It's a poem about a measuring stick. It's so good, and I need a visual. All right. The stick I made for measuring I used most every day. It helped me to compare myself with others on my way. I watched all those behind me or further down the road, and I would readjust my pace or lighten up my load. The only real drawback with how I ran my race was watching everything around me except my savior's face. I was like, melt down to the floor right now? Jesus, I'm so sorry. Because it's so true. That is so true. We're, 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 what? Why? Why is it that if we see someone else is doing better, then we try to pick up the pace to do better? Or if we see someone's further behind us, then we're like, all right, I can coast. We're not trying to do it for us or for what he's saying about us. We're not, we're not putting him in the picture at all. Right? And so the measuring stick, this, here's what happens. It limits my potential and it limits people, people's potential around me. So a couple of years ago, well, I don't know, maybe it's been more than that. But anyway, I had my first sozo and I was like sitting in there trying to process like I just want, if you don't know what sozo is, it's basically like go in and get your junk dealt with. It's amazing like the Holy Spirit really ministers to you and reveals things in you that you need, you need rooted out and you get set free from a lot of really incredible things. So as I'm walking through this, the Holy Spirit revealed to me that like I literally walked around every day with a measuring stick and it just was such a great visual and I was just like, this is awesome. Walked around with this measuring stick and everyone in my life, including myself, had to measure up to the measuring stick, right? But here's the problem. For one thing, that's unfair, and that's limiting my potential because that's saying, oh, I can only go this far, and that's limiting other people's potential because they can only go this far and then they'll stop. But what about this? I would put the measuring stick up, and then here's where they could measure up, but it wouldn't happen that way because then I'd be like, oh, no, wait. You need, you need to go to the top here now. And then it's way up here because what I was doing was never allowing anybody to measure up to what I wanted. And it, like, it really ministered to my heart and it really, really convicted me because I'm like, that is so unfair. Because it, in a selfish way, I'm constantly frustrated because nobody's ever measuring up to what I need done or to what I expect. And then for others, what a life to live constantly being like trying to be met, like trying to meet this expectation that just never ends, right? So here's a good example. Um, I 
I'm just going to say this. There is a difference between having a measuring stick and liking things done. Okay? I like things. There are certain things, and I'm allowed. I want certain things a certain way in my house. Okay? Don't leave your shoes out at the door. Like, there's six of us. That's 12 shoes. At least three of the kids wear two different pairs a day. The, why would you just not take them where they go? These are just some of the things that I, I like. I'm allowed to, to like have, want some of that, right? The only thing is the problem is when I start to cross the line and it's never good enough. So here's the example. Aaron, um, I don't know like his mental process in this, but he, he puts clothes in a pile in the bedroom. And we used to have a chair in there. And one day, I got this like motivation just to kind of redo some things in the house. So without telling him I was doing it, I moved this chair out of the bedroom. And the chair used to be the drop zone. That's where everything constantly was dropped. And so the chair got moved. He came home. He was mad. He's like, I want the chair back. And I'm like, no, that's you. Now you're going to put yourself away. Well, ends up that we had this little clothes hamper basket that's now in our bedroom that contains like our swimsuits and beach towels because I don't have a better place for it. So what does that become? The drop zone. So now he starts to drop all that in there. And he knows, like I tell him, just put yourself away. Like literally from like the clock, like, well for number one, his dresser is next to the clothes hamper. And number two, the closet is, I promise you, like five steps from the clothes hamper. And the laundry room's only two more steps. So there's no reason. It's not like he has to go downstairs. I could maybe understand that. Or upstairs, maybe you could understand that. Literally, it's just all right there in the same path. And, and he just throws them on the drop zone. And I'm just like, he knows that that drives me straight up the wall. And I have gotten so much better over the years. Like, it used to be I would nag about it every day. And now it's maybe... Once a week or two, I'm actually getting very good about it. And um, so, <laughs> but if they're, just, if they're not dirty, put them in the, the dresser that's literally right here. Well, anyway, so last night we get home, and he had been with the kids all day. I, had, I was gone before our marriage thing, so I had left early. He was with the kids all day. And then I came home, again, I, I promise you, I'm really working on the measuring stick. I literally, I don't know if this is right or wrong, I have zero expectation ever, because then, yeah, I'm not let down, you know, and thing. Okay, so I came home, and um, he, let, the kids were in bed, he came back here, because we left some stuff here, so he came back here, and I was like in the bedroom, changing my clothes and stuff, and I walked past the drop zone area, and I was like, Wow, I, I literally thought, oh my gosh, he cleaned that off. And, and, and I even had this thought of, I need to make sure when he comes back that I acknowledge him and say thank you for doing that because it goes both ways, right? I, I see that he did something he knows I like, and then on the other hand, like he's acknowledged that I actually noticed it. And so I promise I had that thought. And so he comes home, I completely forgot to say anything, right? And, and within a couple minutes, he's like, I forget what we were talking about. We, we really weren't bickering or anything, but he's like, look, I even, I even cleaned this off for you. And I'm like, dang it. I forgot. I, really, I wanted to make sure I acknowledge that, you know? But the thing about it is, is it's probably like, I hope he didn't feel this way, but it, in his mind, he could have perceived that as like, I did this and this and this, and it still wasn't good enough. She didn't even acknowledge it. She doesn't even notice, you know? And so... The, the, the thing is, is with that measuring stick and like my little girls, it's like I'm constantly nagging. I am such a nagger. And I just want, I don't want them to, to feel like it's never good enough. Like put your book bag away, your shoes and your dirty clothes. And then they do it. And then instead of me saying, I so appreciate that. Or you know what, let me do that for you today. Instead of me doing any of those types of things to be like, now go clean your room. Now go put this away. It's like, it's the measuring stick. Ding, 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 ding. And it's like, they could never measure up. And just to grow up in that environment is no fun. And so I'm working on it. And I hope that I don't ever portray that on any of you guys, you know? I want you to walk in total freedom and be free to be you. And be free to have your little spot to drop your clothes in. It is whatever. But uh, Saul didn't know 
He, he, his view of himself, he didn't realize that the Bible actually called him the most handsome man in the land. He, he, didn't, he didn't know his identity. And what would that look like if he had known, right? If he had been confident in that, would it have turned into such turmoil between him and David? Because he would have been confident in who he was. 1 Corinthians 11 talks about being imitators of Christ. That is the only one that we should be comparing ourselves to. Constantly, I want to make sure. I want to make sure I'm, in comparison to Jesus, how am I doing? Right? Or, or let me just be better today than I was yesterday. If I can just be better in the car on the way to school today than I was yesterday in the car to school, thank you. You know? I'm not going to compare myself to these. Look, there are tricks to this. Those of you who take your kids to school in the morning, if you put on sunglasses, put your hair up in a bun, put on a cute top, you're good, right? I don't want to get caught up in having to do all my makeup, make sure I look perfect just to drop my kids off to school. I'm confident in who I am. You know what? Fine. No, don't even put on the sunglasses. I don't makeup on. I'm in shower today. I don't care. The kids made it to school by the time they need to be there, right? All right. Galatians 6, 4. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. It's just what I said. Just we're constantly viewing our own actions. Okay. Lastly, view it, how do I view others? Okay. Here, here's what happens here. We start, like Aaron and I have talked about this a lot. If you're viewing us with this expectation that we will be perfect, and he kind of touched on it last week. You know, there are people in your lives that you, you may look at and expect that they will never let you down. I found out something over the past couple of weeks that completely devastated me about someone that I would have never imagined. But it didn't wreck my faith. It didn't, it didn't change my views on things. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's like, because I know that even though I would expect something different from this person, I, I, I'm not, it, God is the ultimate one, right? Like he's on, the only one that's not going to let me down. And so our view of others cannot be perverted in such a way that we rely on someone else to fill in the gaps for us to be this, the sturdy one and, and not Jesus. You know what I mean? We can have mentors and people who speak wisdom into us, but that's different than putting all of our eggs in their basket. And then the minute that they screw up or make a mistake or inadvertently do something to hurt you, now we're completely devastated. We don't know our identity. We don't know who we are. We're a hot mess, right? Because we've, we've, our view of, of others is distorted, okay? In Mark 12, 30, it's the verse that talks about loving the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and the thing is this, when our focus is on others and what others think of us and others say about us and, and measuring up and all these things, that means a piece of us is not completely loving him because we've given a piece of it to someone else whatever that looks like. And so it's, a, it's just this, this commandment of loving him with every ounce of us. And so our goal, even though we mess it up and we don't do it every day, is to love him entirely. And, and that helps keep us on the right track. When we compare ourselves to others, I already said this, but unmet expectations and people let us down the measuring stick. We limit their p potential. My gosh, if, if, if I continue to have this measuring stick for my kids all the time, what, they're going to only go to the point to where they think they have to reach. So I limit the potential in them because they'll never go above and beyond. They'll say, okay, I've done all these things mom wanted me to do. Done. But, but I'm limiting them in like, well, what if they actually want to do something else or you know, do this thing or that thing or whatever. I'm limiting their p potential and I'm, I'm limiting my opportunity to believe in them to do more, right? Romans 2, 1. You therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Hello. All right, Romans 14, 13. 
Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. And that is so good. When we pass judgment, we're actually creating an opportunity for, for them to stumble. And that kind of goes back, even if, you, if what I was saying about the potential, we're putting a block in their way from them walking out their full purpose because of the judgments that we've placed on them. I don't want to do that. When we're caught up in this mess, this does not just affect us. This affects everyone around us, whether we think that or not. All right, the last tweet with the little birdie. And this is what, what we got to talking about earlier. It says, never compare someone else's highlight reel with your behind the scenes footage. That is so good. Just be honest. How many of you make sure that the picture you post on Facebook or Instagram is like the best angle? I've, I've taught Aaron, you've gotta like, you gotta do this, right? You gotta have like, don't be this way, you know, certainly, right? What people put out there and what, you're, what we're finding ourselves comparing to, like you're not seeing me when I roll out of bed. You're comparing yourself to me when I might be at my height of, beauty right that is the highlight you don't see the behind the scenes when we're comparing ourselves to people in all these different ways you're you're com what you're comparing to is not apples to apples i i'm getting more and more from that ex ex the expression apples to apples it's like the robot right you're comparing yourself and your behind the scenes mess to somebody else's perfected world and that is so unfair. Isn't that such a tactic of the devil? <sighs> All right. Romans 8, 1 through 2. This is my last verse, and then we're just going to pray for you guys, and then we'll be done. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so as we are walking this out, our freedom, it, it, there is no condemnation. But there is freedom and there is life. And I, I don't know about you, but I just want to be completely set free from this. I, when, I, when we did the women's conference, the Lord really revealed to me like some dead place in my heart. And just over the past couple months, I've been on this journey to figure out why is that there? What is that from? And I think some, there is some pieces of it as things that I've personally shut off. But I really feel like as I was studying through this, I feel like the Lord was just revealing to me that my getting wrapped up in these comparison and competition stuff has really created like the dead place, a lot of that dead place in my heart. And so I'm just really anxious and excited for what this looks like as I, be, as I continue, because I'm just saying it, I'm not there yet. I want to be, but what does it look like for me and for you guys as we are walking out this journey of when I, if I compare myself, it's only because I want to, exemplify and edify and lift up and promote what somebody else is doing. It's, it's not to make me feel worse about who I am or to make myself feel better than someone else, you know? So, okay, would you stand? I'm just want, we're going to pray for ourselves, which is unusual here at Upper Room. Usually we make you pray for others. And those of you who don't like praying for others, you're like, yes, we're not praying for anybody else. All right, I want you to put your hand on your heart. I'm just going to release this freedom over you. And so God... I thank you so much for, for who you are. I just start out by asking, Lord, that you would just perfect our view of you. God, that our view of who you are in us and who you've created us to be, Lord, is completely perfected, God, that it's not perverted in any way, shape, or form, that you would continue to reveal, bring us revelation about who you are, perfect our view of you. And God, we just ask too that you would help us on our view of ourselves. Lord, that the, the scriptures and the truths become the loudest thing that we hear, become the loudest voice that we hear, that your word, that we were fearfully and wonderfully made, Lord, that it penetrates our very inner being. God, that it is the very voice that screams louder than anything else, that our view of ourselves is being so perfected because our eyes are on you and not on anyone around us, in front of us, or behind us. And Lord, just help us navigate through this 
way that we view others. Lord, I thank you for the ones you've brought into our lives who do get to be mentors to us, who do get to pour into us, that we get to glean from. But Lord, I just ask that that, that too would say very pure, God, and that our view of others is is just to see the gold, to see what you have in them, what you have for them, Lord, but also that, that we don't get caught up in these crazy expectations of people, God, that we know that you are the only one that will never, ever, ever let us down, that you are the king of our heart, that we view you so purely, we view ourselves purely, and that we view others so purely. God, I just thank you that, that today is a day where we're just slicing off that snake's head of comparison and competition and the, the, the temptation to judge others and judge ourselves. And man, God, I just thank you that you just are always wanting to, to so gently just purify us and correct us and get us on the straight path, Lord, and, and that your heart's desire for us is to walk in total freedom. So I just speak to every dead part of hearts today, every hurt part, every guarded part, every messed up part of our hearts, Lord, that, that things would begin to come unlayered, God, that we could just really begin to see the growth and this, the wholeness and the freedom that you desire. So just thank you so much, Lord. You're so good. In Jesus' name, amen. Woo. Happy Mother's Day.